Welcome to Game of Roses. This is Pace Case. This is Bachelor Clues, and we're back. Jen Trans, Bachelor at Season Night 21. Night one, baby. Night one has begun. Uh, we're going to break it all down for you right now. Everything that we witnessed in this historic moment for the Bachelor franchise. I can't wait to dig into this. But before we do, Pace Case, we do have some business. Very important business. It's business time. Every Monday. For the duration of Gen Trans Bachelorette Season 21, you can join us at 33 Taps in Silver Lake. That's in Los Angeles, 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. We're going to be there watching the show with anybody else who is in the greater Los Angeles area or the. Should we um, say the piece of lesser. news that's connected to that? Please do. We got screeners, baby. 2020 Indeed, gore. Another manifestation <laughs> come true. I'm so proud of us. There is nothing we can't. Uh, we didn't accomplish. even make a song. We didn't even make a song looking for him. Didn't need to. I, we did say it every week for some time, but yeah. our powers are growing. I'm so happy. As am I. It's literally <laughs> That's changed why we her can lives. Do this live party. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Clues we're and excited I are currently to see... recording in the daylight. It feels weird. It does feel a little bit weird, <laughs> but we're excited to see everybody come out. If you can, again, we're we're out here in Los Angeles. If you're in L.A. or you're taking a trip to L.A. and you're here on a Monday night during the course of Gen Trans season, just show up at 33 Taps in Silver Lake and we'll be there. One of us will be there. Well, uh, I will be there degree. for the first two and yeah. then I will be in Minnesota. As will <laughs> I. I'll, yes. I'll be there for the first two also. Uh, I'll, I'll probably try to come every night. As long as we can keep getting the screeners and everything, I'll probably, probably try to come to every one of them. So we hope you'll join us for that. I'm probably that. just going to stay in 33 Taps. Probably just hide. Yeah, might as well. Get a job there. We also have this news. We have a new piece of merch that is germane to this season. It's a shot glass for Shot O'Clock. And this shot O'Clock, heard of it? Uh, I've heard of it a little too much, in fact, after <laughs> night one. I couldn't believe, we'll get into it. I'm doing the podcast before we're doing the podcast. We I still know. have business. We have a shot glass. It's a Love Levels shot glass, a Game of Roses official Love Level shot glass. So it has these demarcations on the shot glass for Love Level 1, 2, 3, and 4. And you're meant to pour that level of a shot anytime you hear one of, of those any Love kind Levels. Of medicine you want. Take the shot. It could be anything. It could be cough syrup. Coffee. Whatever you like. Um, jet alert. I don't know what that is. That's a caffeine pill for truck drivers. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. I mean, if that's what you're into, that's what you're into. Good luck to everybody out there uh, if you're on the road. Now- We don't condone um, any kind, specific type of medicine. No, we don't. To be clear. Um, all right, Pace Case, shall we do this? Our business then is concluded here. Let's uh, dive Let's into- Oh, shot o'clock, baby. Gen I hope trans. I get my shot glass by the viewing party. As do I'll I. Bring it. Gen Trans, season 21. This is Game of Roses. Game of Roses. Okay, so we open this with this little teaser, and The Bachelor has been very good about altering the way they open their shows. It used to be a long mm -hmm. teaser that basically shows you everything you're going to see over the course of that night's episode. That shit is gone. Now they're doing this brilliant thing where they show us a moment from the end of the season to get us hyped up like, oh shit, how do we get to that point? We have to wait and watch. And so... With this opening teaser, we see Jen Tran telling an unknown player that she can't let him propose to her. Then she puts the final rose back on the final rose pedestal and uh, Dark Lord Palmer, Jesse Palmer a comes in. tan suit. We just see shoulder. Yeah, you just get a little shoulder, a little tricep. Can't tell if there's muscularity here or vascularity. The mm. clothing is hindering our view. Uh, then Palmer asks her if she's okay with whatever's going to happen and she walks down the hall and does a knock-knock on somebody's hotel room. What? Now, let me ask you this. Okay. Yeah. Those don't seem like those are connected. The knock knock seems like I it's agree. happening before the final rose ceremony. Correct. I think this is cut to hell. I won't be hell. tricked. I won't I be tricked, tricked either. And I'll just ask I you this. I am tricked. I feel like she proposes. You think she proposes to somebody? She's either proposing or she's wall macking. Well, they definitely what are, have. What other option? In this. I agree. I mean, at least from the way they've cut it, those are your two options. She's proposing or she's Will Macking. Will Macking season one. Um, but either of those seems too 11. dramatic to actually be true. So I feel I like agree. I am being tricked. I agree. And if you so... compare this with Grazia Day's teaser, you had that man hyperventilating, too hot, had to take off his jacket. Producers mm -hmm. are ushering him around. He's crying. He, he does, looks it's like he doesn't know where he is. Beautiful tear play. This to me 
Like, it was good. I'm curious to see what happens at the end here. I'm curious to see what all this is. Yeah. But it wasn't like Grazia Days, in my opinion. It didn't have the gravitas. You wanted to see Jen hyperventilate. I just wanted to see a little more of an impactful moment. Maybe a moment. bachelorette squat cry. Something. A squat cry would have been good, yes. But this squat was good cry. enough. It got me in. I'm curious. Yeah. And this is the drama that we're all kind of waiting to see. Then we get into the main body of the show. We cut to Jen. She's telling us her age. She's the bachelorette. And we get this kind of thing that we always get with an incoming lead. It's basically a montage of them doing things they like to do and kind of giving us a sense of who this person is going to be as a lead. We see Jen is playing a bunch of different sports. Lacrosse is one of them, interestingly. We see her then in a doctor's office, or maybe it's a hospital. She's talking to these two older nurses about PA school, and one of them is says basically, you're a beautiful person inside and out, and I know you're going to find true love. This is essentially a pre-blessing from a civilian in her life. Beautifully, been, this beautifully done. This civilian who uttered this blessing, first blessing to Jen of our season was my Jorge, 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 Jorge Moreno, bystander of the week. Oh my God. I love this. I was torn between this and the fan, the Jen fan girls. Right. But I thought that this lady really shone and she was the star of this moment mm. and kind of serving like a, a work mom type role. So yeah. it's kind of, it's kind of blessing ask. I agree. I agree with you. And listen, in my notes, the words Jorge Moreno bystander of the week were written next to this woman's uh, <laughs> note, but then they were erased <laughs> a little bit later. <laughs> erased. <laughs> we see Jen with her mom. Uh, her mom tells her she wants her to find a man who is never going to let her cry. And I just wrote, uh, mom, have you ever watched The Bachelorette? Jen will be crying. I'm very sorry to tell you. That's going to happen almost every week. And then we see Jen gets a she little uh, ITM. By the way, yeah. the only reason I think Jen might propose, which we've mm. never seen The Bachelorette do to the guy, like Ben Donnie, is I feel like she displays some reader behavior to me. I feel like she is a yeah. great player. Yeah. And yeah. she's dropping you these know, that little That was some hints. Hakeem level faceplay clues. I mean, how dare you? Hakeem is on another level of all humans. We will get to his face. I that know. man is going to be a faceplay god. Um, mm -hmm. What she does in terms of setting up in these ITMs that it's, it's her control, and they even did it in her promo. She's taking the power back. I think that's because you might be right about her proposing taking control of the whole narrative. Mm -hmm. And if she does that, that... definitely seems like that on the theme of that. If she proposes at the final rose ceremony or whatever, somewhere around it in the finale, that will be historic. That is something that will cement her as one of the greatest bachelorettes to have ever lived, if she does that, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, yeah. Ultimately, we see her in this park with two Asian women uh, that she seemingly doesn't know, but they've cut it a little strange. I'm like, are these her friends? Who are these people? But they basically they are come up to fans? her. Yeah, they're they're fans who recognize her, I guess. They come up to her and they tell her that it means so much that she's an Asian bachelorette because there's never been one. And these uh, Asian women telling Jen how important it is that there's now an Asian bachelorette. We're my Jorge, 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 Jorge Moreno, bystander of the week. I will simply say this, though, about this moment. It's mm -hmm. it, Obviously, this is a huge moment for the Bachelor franchise in terms of representation, diversity, all of this. When you compare The Bachelor to, let's say, Love is Blind or any of the Netflix shows who don't have really the same kind of representation problem, this moment stands out to me as like, it's antiquated. It's weird a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because if you watch like Love is Blind- calling attention to yes, it. Patting themselves yeah. on the back a little too hard. They cast those women to come up and do that and said, you have to I know. talk I, about I this. I can't help know? thinking. I'm like, what? Did they just pick two Asian women out of like a crowd of people? They would just like yes. went to the Grove. <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. But it seems weird. It feels fake. It did feel weird. But it did remind me of Pilot Pete going through the airport. It did feel like that. They're like, but it should have just, it should have been like more people. I don't know. 
it just felt like it's a fine line. It's a fine line. It is a fine line. And I obviously am very happy that we are getting our first Asian bachelor. I'm happy about all those things, but the way they're presenting it is a little weird. It's a little like, we don't quite know what we're doing and, but we need to service this as a storyline. And it's like, but if you look at any other contemporary dating reality show, the way to service it is to just be like, yeah. And you know, like there's never in love is blind. Like, Oh my God. We've got an Asian woman on Love is Blind. Can you believe it? Like, they don't have to do that. But Bachelor does. And I think by calling attention to yeah. it in this way, it just is, a, it feels but they have a little the racist, old. No, but they have to. They have the racist past to contend with. Love is Blind doesn't have that. Right. Um, I know. I know. We yep. then see we this four-part PTC that Jan loads her heartbreak in the past of her relationships, her parents fighting growing up, her dad didn't love her, and her Joey heartbreak from Joey's season. Mm -hmm. I love this. It was. I feel like Jen is very clear on what her kind of brand for the season is, and it is this person who is kind of, it's a kind of an unlovable storyline of like she doesn't yeah. have that example of love, hasn't experienced it, but wants it. Um and I think she did a fantastic job setting this up. I agree. And then we see her with her family and her having a full-on uh, conversation with her mom about in Vietnamese speaking about her finding that special person, which I loved. It We don't see that many conversations in other languages on the show. I always think of the first time Mary they Delgado. had this. Mary Delgado Season with six. her family. Yeah. <laughs> It was a great moment. Que que tú sufra como ha sufrido otra vez y no queremos verte sufrir. Um but yeah, there just aren't that many of them, so I lo I love to see this and we get mom tears right off the bat. Yeah. Beautiful. No, it it was good. Her her bachelorette intro package was good. It had all the necessary pieces and uh I don't know, it got me excited for what this season is going to be because you know we're going to see her mom and her family again in the finals when whoever the final two are they're gonna have to meet that exact same family but then we cut to los angeles and we see her doing her photo shoot and everything getting all uh ready to be the bachelorette mm -hmm. and she rides in a mansion to the new limo this is not villa de la vina dlp greets her as they talk Wait, about i'm sorry but there is a maybelline fit me product placement right in there oh, shout out to grocery good job grocery good job serene here um then we see Jesse Palmer meets her in front of this mansion, which is not Villa de la Vina, where they have shot every season since 12, I think, uh, or 11, maybe. I Bachelor. think it was 12. Um, yeah, season 12 of The Bachelor. So now we have this new mansion, but it's not exactly new because DLP tells us it's the famous hummingbird nest ranch. And not, and not the COVID seasons, but yeah. Right. Um, this is where they shot Listen to Your Heart, speaking of COVID seasons. Is it? I believe so, yes. <laughs> And the That's first exciting. limo is a legacy, on... a rich legacy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We try to forget these things, but they won't let us. And then the first limo shows up. We hear some guys cheering for Jen and we get our first limo exit. This is the alpha. Usually the alpha and omega limo exits are meaningful. These will be players who last throughout the season to some degree, make some kind of an impact. And our first limo exit is Marcus 31. He's an army ranger veteran from Raleigh, North Carolina. And he tells us about his, his three big dreams, to serve his country, to go to outer space, and to find his person. And he's been lucky enough that some of those dreams have come true. And we get our first intro package as well. We see him jumping out of a plane, uh, doing his Army Ranger stuff, telling, telling us how he had six deployments in his last mission. He almost got killed loading this giant PTC here, which we're going to see later for sure on a one-on-one -on -one date, I would imagine. And essentially now he Guaranteed. appreciates life more than he did. Five years since he's dated, seriously, he's open to love. And uh, he packs I mean, up how many flag. people can use a PTC that's like, I'm grateful for the grenade. <laughs> it's a yeah, pretty, packs, I mean, packs a punch. If you are a PTC, by the way, stands for personal tragedy card. And this is any story that you're going to tell to basically say, this is a trauma that happened to me. And it turned me into this kind of a person or I have learned from that trauma in some way. And now it has made me ready to find love. He plays it or loads it here at least pretty perfectly. He hasn't played it fully to her yet. But this is exactly how you load a very strong PTC. I'm looking forward to seeing him actually playing that in game. 
Uh, let's jump around. I noted here. there were no night one players that got intro packages. Every intro was someone who kept going. Yeah, they did a good job of that. Sometimes they'll try to throw you off. <laughs> they'll give a full intro package to some guy who gets no more screen time beyond the intro package. But let's jump around here to Correct. just some of the big uh, limo exits. We're not going to cover them all. Just hit the heavy hitters. Third limo exit was Sam N, <laughs> an entrepreneur, 25-year-old entrepreneur from Carlsbad, California. <laughs> So he what is happening in Carlsbad? I have no idea. Carlsbad is also where Heather no Martin kissing. was from, uh, who was famously a, a kiss virgin. Here's the thing. I've never had sex before, and I have never kissed anyone. Sam N reveals that he's a love virgin, and he gets this kind of thing in his promo that leads us to fool believe. Fool intro. What's that? I thought it was a fool intro package. They show him curling oh, his sure. eyelashes, which I don't think we've ever seen before. Not to my knowledge. It was for sure a fool intro package. And he floats this idea that he wants his first girlfriend to be his wife. This immediately, you know this man is, she's immediately not choosing him. He's not a viable yeah. candidate. The producers will keep him around for this storyline, though, <laughs> to see if he's a love virgin, is he going to fall in love? Mm -hmm. And what is that going to mean to him that... Maybe he gets that a hometown. He can't marry and, his first know. love. Exactly. Yeah. His first girlfriend, he's not going to marry her. Uh, we don't know. I'm curious to see how this guy plays out. But this was ultimately just yeah. a standy um, limo exit. We get um, some beatboxing. We get a basketball PTC from Grant. We had several people tell Jen that she's taking their last name, which I didn't like. Yep. And... We get a Sam M intro, the South Carolina guy who to me ha is doing an impression of Bradley Cooper. A little oh, bit. Boy. Yeah, he's in that area for sure. It is like <laughs> jarring every time I hear it's good voice play. Yeah. Uh, he loads a PTC. Asks her to picture promo. 50 years from now cooking breakfast. <laughs> yeah, it's like, wait a minute. You're 27. So you're talking about cooking breakfast when you're 77 years old? <sighs> 50 years was now. too you long. You think I'm going to be cooking when I'm 77? Come I'm on. Not, robots are going to be cooking everything for me when I'm 77. You kidding me? <laughs> That's what Jen should have said. Are yeah. you kidding me? Yeah. The You're robots will be cooking at that point, years? Sam. <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> Dismissed. I'm only looking for somebody who wants a robot 50. Tell me your 50-year plan. Does it include robots? If not, good day. We also get... Uh, good day, sir. Brendan had an interesting limo exit, I thought. He takes a bite out of this habanero pepper and throws it on the ground. This is a prop standee. They give him a bunch of fool music as well. Uh, if we move down that the list here. That was interesting. A little bit. Dakota we get a did a standee with the wine thing. Shouldn't have done that, Dakota. It makes you a one-trick pony when your, your job but, is your limo exit. What else joke. is he going to do? The man loves wine. He's a sommelier. I know, but you could save that, you know, and make that your one-on-one -on -one time and give some other aspect of your personality. Yeah. It just makes me think they're making you like you're the pantsapreneur or you're like the yeah. chicken girl. You're not a real like shot for crown or ring winner. You know what he should have done? He should have gotten a giant wine bottle and put himself inside it and yes. made her- Tabletop um, it. Yeah. Made her cut the top off with a giant sword and then he crawls out. That would have been a better one. We see okay, some- Okay, uh, he's good. Ed Waste brought it. <laughs> yeah. Why not? The man who entered in a you giant bubble. You kind of did an Ed Waste brought? Look, I'll just go into this. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to cut a little video that talks about love this levels. Seems like a minutia. This isn't minutia. It's side project, but also Bachelor. I'm trying to make this video that talks about love levels and kind of explains them. So I'm going back and like cutting a bunch of clips from old seasons where people are playing love levels. And I just rewatched the um, Crystal's Caitlin Bristow one on one date where they go to Costco and get in that oh, ball yeah. and roll around. I remember that. That was a great date. <laughs> it's so insane. God, it's those the dream Costco date. I want to be rolling to Costco. Um, okay, so oh, moving on. Tomas, we got it. Okay, do you consider dogs sidecars? Well, the limo yes. exit type. We'll get to that. Someone. I want to just quickly mention that we have multiple guys doing shot o'clock themed uh, limo exits right before this, which mm -hmm. I think is a mistake. You have to know in watching her season that that catchphrase is bad. It's not going to take. She doesn't want to do it. 
Nobody wants to remember this. And they're all coming in with it. Now that said, producers, here's how these limo exits work. Okay, when you come into the game, there's a maybe two or three day period where you're sequestered in the hotel room and the producers are uh, kind of communicating with you daily, multiple times a day. You're talking about what you want your limo exits to be. And they're behind the scenes trying to work to see if they can get you the the, the harness with the million balloons or whatever the thing may be. The that giant you need for your, bra. Your exit. Right. So all these guys either had these ideas or the producers gave them the ideas to do the shot o'clock thing. Either way, the mm -hmm. producers were okay with it and allowed three of them to do it. I think that was a mistake, yeah. in my opinion. Look, I I love a catchphrase for a season, but I yeah. do agree Shot O'Clock seemed like it was just a, uh, what do we do, what do we do? Okay, Shot O'Clock, uh, okay, that'll be the theme. And then you're going into it so much. Yes. When it doesn't have to do with Jen, she's not like a bartender or something. like. Correct. I don't know. It's out of nowhere. It seemed last minute when they did it on her Bachelorette announcement, and now it's mm -hmm. this weird last minute thing that is echoing through her season, and it's like, if we see another shot of clock ever again in this season, somebody has fucked up their job. Like, no one watching this remembers Jen ever even said that. Except exactly. us, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we made a shot glass, let's be fair. Uh, I mean, look, we leaned into <laughs> Shutterclock, GameOfRoses.co, lean in farther with us. Yeah, lean in to Shutterclock. We're going to make 200 different shot Actually, glasses. Actually, it's a great catchphrase. I yeah. think they should Never do it mind what anything Never I just mind. said. But yeah, then we come to our 15th limo exit out of 25, and it is Thomas A., 27 physiotherapist from Toronto. And he comes out with two gorgeous puppies and these puppies were my creature of the week <laughs> and i do think this is a sidecar a sidecar limo exit by the mm -hmm. way is when you come into the game you emerge from the limo and someone else is with you we've seen neil lane perform a sidecar we've seen a grandmother perform a sidecar have we seen a sister a chorus. A chorus perform a sidecar. Here we see um, two canines. Big Polly, I think, has been a sidecar. Um, these little pups <laughs> that make Jen want shot o'clock to last forever because they were so cute and DLP squealed with joy because, as we all know, he's a doggy daddy. We're my. Creature of the week. Yeah, they were great. So cute. Great creatures. So cute. Uh, I loved this they limo exit. They should have this every year. I agree. I didn't give this my limo exit of the game, but it was it was mm -hmm. up there. It was a, a smart move, and it doesn't require a lot of extra stuff, which is usually a good limo exit, in my humble opinion. But let's mm -hmm. move on to Jonathan. <laughs> Our very nice limo exit. Now, oh my God. <laughs> we have seen uh, what we call tots or trick or treats. These are limo exits where you're, you're dressed up in some capacity. We even saw a couple, uh, other than this one, on night one, uh, there was the dude who came in with a stethoscope. That counts as a tot, a trick or treat. Mm -hmm. You have dressed up in some way beyond the ski boots, the ski boots right beyond just your, your general suit and regular shoes. If you have anything else, that is a trick or treat. Now, Jonathan's mm -hmm. trick or treat was the most extreme that we did see. He comes in on a stretcher, which also makes it a grandy, a grand entrance. He's not coming in on the limo. He then Big is... Polly's pushing him. Yeah, Big Polly's pushing him. It was technically a sidecar with Big Polly. Yeah, you're right. We got to put this in the sidecar. Let me update my statistics. Um, it technically was a sidecar. You're fucking... God, you're right. He comes in, his and his whole head is wrapped up like a mummy. He only has like eyes and mouth sticking out. He's in a full hospital gown, which when he gets up off the gurney, we see he, there's nothing on underneath it, supposedly. I don't know if that's accurate or not. I have to imagine it's not exactly. They probably put him in a thong or something, I would guess. You don't think he's naked? I don't think he's fully naked, no. Huh, interesting. Ugh, I'm tricked again. He, maybe he's he is. just like Kenny. But he comes out and he says he's lovesick. Uh, first impressions I love are this, everything. This voluntary nudity play, like a little butt. That's like a that's like yeah. a cheeky voluntary nudity play. He's, he even it's says not that. a p word. 
He's like, I can be a little bit cheeky. And she says, so can I? Ha ha ha. He turns around and we see his his buttocks are supposedly exposed. We get a big red rose graphic over it instead of a traditional black box. I did like that. It elevated like it a that. little bit. Exactly. It's it's like cla- a classy black box. Yeah. A classy black box and one that says like, we're on your side. The black box can this sometimes- is, We're on your side. It is. It's, it's basically the producer saying like, we support this. And clearly they did because they manufactured <laughs> yeah. this. They had to make this happen. But a black box is something different. A black box is this person doesn't even know that the their pubic hair is sticking through their jeans or something mm-hmm. like this, if you remember that um, yeah. horrible black box. I mean, that's the most famous black box of all time. I mean, <laughs> when they black box that lady's pants? Yeah, her jeans. It didn't make any sense. I know. It didn't make any sense. Um, we get some good... I feel bad. Ricky had some good one-liners. My little sister's going to watch this. Yeah. Um, we get uh, one of the limo exits. I was anticipating the most. Mm. An old Aaron Herb motorcycle grandy where he enters on a motorcycle. I feel like this is a prestige entrance. Totally. Jen did a similar type of entrance where she's like letting her hair hair loose. And um he gets an intro. We hear about how his brother his twin brother, paternal twin brother, is uh the young Noah Herb, and he is getting married to Abigail, who he met on Paradise, so the process has worked. We get a PTC that he was divorced from a marriage at 21. And then we get another grandy. This is it has a different tone. A yeah. red Corvette, and this man Jeremy comes out and throws his keys at DLP and says, "Hey Palmer, keep it close." But his acting's bad. He's nervous. His voice is quavering. He doesn't have the juice to pull this one off. It's a brilliant idea for a limo exit, but this mm-hmm. is a villain limo exit, and I don't think this guy's yes. a villain. He's um he's a little he's too. He's a single dad, isn't he? Nervous. This is the single dad? Jeremy, I don't know. Possibly. No, maybe I just, no, I think I'm wrong, actually. But he compounds what is a poor performance on this limo exit by walking up to Jen and saying, I know what they say about people who drive sports cars, but let me just assure you, I have a really big penis. And this was my... Error, 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 error of the game. You simply never, whether in Bachelor or in life, talk about the size of your penis, I feel like. I think it's just an error, generally speaking. If other people want to talk about it, that's fine. You should never be the one who's like, just to let you know, I have a very big penis. In general, I think like a meat cute does mm-hmm. not involve describing your genitalia. I agree. Yep. But I actually had a different error. And oh. Jen says, did you just say the P word? And he says, it'll be bleeped out. So this was compounding the error, being like, I'm so aware of the edit in this. Yeah. I know what kind of like not only so aware of the edit. Do. I'm so aware of the edit that I know the thing I'm saying isn't even usable. Then why say it? Mm-hmm. And by the way, they don't have to bleep out penis. They just did that, I think, because he said that. <laughs> so he's not even right. Correct. You can say the word oh, penis God. on network television. That's a, Ugh, a, a stylistic error. choice on the producer's part there. <laughs> you have to pronounce it penis, though. <laughs> of course. Uh, moving uh, on. He's played chess. We're playing checkers. Someone says, love yeah. that. Gameplay. Um, another one I was looking forward to, Dylan enters with a top stethoscope and mm. we get this intro about why he went into medicine, PTC about his grandma having breast cancer. So he's shadowing the doctors. Oh, yeah. so for TRR. He's going to stick and around. Jen loads a love level one for him after his exit. Yes. Which is an, I like you or I'm feeling butterflies. It's something just kind of initiating the idea that you have an emotional connection to that person or with that person. Then we get a series of blandies and standies that are kind of all unremarkable. We see uh, Jahan oh, gives I like her the a chess one. piece. <laughs> yeah, the pedal- pedestal one wasn't too bad. Um, Jahan gives her a chess piece, the queen. This is a weird kind of cringle. We see uh, 
Devin talking about how good she looks and meeting his future wife, ultimately a Blandy, but he gets a big promo package. And then our Omega is Hakeem, who comes out. This is a Grandy Standy Pot. Grand entrance. Standy is short for stand up, which is you have some pre-prepared lines that you're going to say. And taut, of course, is trick or treat, a costume. This is one of the most unique things I've ever seen. He comes in wearing a giant harness full of a hundred helium balloons, maybe. And he explains mm -hmm. that the balloons signified how he felt when she, when he found out she was the crown. He was on cloud nine. There will always be ups and downs, but he's going to be there to uplift her. These are the canned lines that he's prepared. And this limo exit was my limo exit of the game. It was just Me too. the the vision of it, the thing that you're seeing on your screen, because of the balloons, his kind of presence is just bigger than anyone Magnified. else could have been. It was uh, it's beautifully so done. It's so whimsical. Yeah. We've never seen it before. I'm like, how has no one ever even thought to do this before? Um, I didn't even know that I thing loved existed. It. A, a I loved it so hearts? much. It required so much prep. Yeah. And uh, and it also included this like follow up where they're popping the balloon. It takes two. Mm -hmm. He also gets this little bit where he's caught in the trees. It like lengthened his limo exit and yeah. made you focus on him. It was also my favorite limo exit. Although I did really like the bandage man yeah, too. Me too. I thought that was like a a wonderful take on this kind of hidden face play, which we have seen before. We've seen a full night outfit. Mm. We saw a man just wearing a mask who refused to take it off. Dear Joe Fletcher had this. Um, Technically. Well, just on her own no exit. Yeah, she yeah. came out wearing a unicorn head. But Rick Leach, tabletop, did the opposite. His hid the body. His head was out mm -hmm. of the table, but you couldn't see his body until later, until he was allowed his to was crawl torture. out of it. Yeah, his was physical torture. I think he was. They put him in an iron tortured, maiden. forced to crouch for like four hours. <laughs> oh, Rick Leach, thank you for your suffering. Oh, uh, then tabletop. we go into the mansion. I mean, that here. was. I'll never forget that one. That was so good. No, neither will I. We go into the mansion and we get Jen's inauguration speech. Never in a million years did she think she'd be the bachelorette. So it's kind of this idea of like, I'm not worthy of this position. She talks about what yeah, love means to her. They play it up a lot. Uh, and that she never had a good role model of what love was growing up, but she's figured out her worth and what she deserves. That ferocious love. She says that once more. Nobody's perfect, but they're going to have fun with it. And some guys uh, in the background say, I love that twice. We also got an I love that, by the way, from oh, Jen in that. one of the limo exits. Um, this is a phrase that Ari Leindyke uh, popularized to us. Yeah, he overused it, let's say. He, he was saying I love that probably four to five times an episode. So then she toasts to all of the guys into finding love. And Sam M is the first responder. Not only did he give her her drink when she came in to do the toast. The first responder, mm -hmm. by the way, is very generally the person on the rightmost part of the screen in that horseshoe around the pit group. And that person is tasked by producers with giving the lead their drink with which they will make their toast in the inauguration speech. And then very often that person also gets the opportunity to pull the lead first to go have the conversation. That's what we see mm -hmm. here. Sam M takes her for this. We call first both of those a first responder right now. We do need another term. We do need to split it up, but technically he got both first responder roles here. And he Literally, his play on this one-on-one -on -one was so good. Yeah. He kind of went off of her, like, I want a ferocious type of love. And he says, I want a reckless love. Mm -hmm. I got to get that reckless Bradley Cooper love. Yeah. Using the word reckless, is it was a good bit of neuro-linguistic programming. You don't want to mm -hmm. use the exact word. You want to use a word that's very similar, that shows your simpatico, but in a little bit of a different way. You're your own person, but mm -hmm. you like the same things. It was brilliantly done. And obviously he, um, you know, makes an impression there, shall we say. We'll get to that in a moment. And, and he goes, I love who you are as a person. Love level one. I'm yeah, giving that. Absolutely. And uh, he leans in at the end of this for a kiss, and she kind of gives him the cheek. So he doesn't pull off a, a whole kiss here. And that becomes something that they talk about throughout the course of this episode. Is Jen going to kiss anybody on night one? Generally speaking on night one, mm -hmm. at least in, in recent seasons, Everybody's making out all the time. You, you see four mm -hmm. and five kisses in a regular episode of Modern Bachelor or Bachelorette on night one. 
This ain't yeah. that. I, w- I almost gave this my error because you never want your kiss to be swerved. It means you're not yeah. reading the body language, et cetera, that well. Mm-hmm. Um, but luckily, his uh, Bradley Cooper accent got him through this. And Brett <laughs> saying, you look like you should be in Top Gun 3. Loved that. I. <laughs> it is a crime that Brett went home after yep. he said this line and did the splits. Brett and Ricky. I'm just like, I'm watching right? the show and I just, we'll get to it Why in the end. Why did they get rid of Brett and Ricky? I have some theories. We'll get to it in the end, but, but it's important to keep in mind for anybody who's watching this show, Jen Tran is not picking who goes home on night one. The producers are. She tells the mm-hmm. producers, I like these two or three guys. She kind of has already locked in who are going to yeah, be her pick finalists. pick your top four or whatever. Yeah. And then the producers line everybody else up and decide which one of these guys do we want to keep around for which storylines and rivalries and who might be a villain and all that kind of stuff. So when they kick you off on night one, it literally means we don't think you're going to be good on TV. We can't do anything with what you're giving us. And I just don't get that with Ricky and Brett because just in this night one alone, they outperformed many of the guys who stayed, in my opinion. Yes, people who are doing less. Yeah. Um, We see... Portrait man gets a one-on-one. We get quick pops of Thomas talking about Vietnam. Now, I thought this uh, was... They're both... Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Both of their... They play kind of this mirror family PTC that both of their families gave up a lot in order to have them have the best lives possible. And he reveals that he swam for Vietnam. So he's like, oh, is he the best in the country? Kind of hinting at... Yeah, Going the national the team or something like this. He also shows two finger tattoos that have significance because they're Vietnamese flags. He has dual citizenship. Mm. So they're really hitting hard that that is their connection, their ethnicity, their heritage, the way their families are structured. Uh, and that's going to be their their main component, it feels like, in their relationship. And I don't mm-hmm. know where that gets him other than hometowns. I feel like almost 100% this man is going to hometowns. I think they wouldn't. I don't know if they would have focused on it that much for him to not make it. I agree. And I... We'll see. We'll see where it goes. But we ultimately, we see some other... They're joking about uh, Jonathan's head wrappings and if they're ever going to get to see his face. <laughs> and then we see uh, Thomas A. is kind of standing at the front of the room. This is the guy who, who came with the puppies. And he proposes a game of truth or dare and i'm like oh that's bold and then we cut to a giant dice that they're rolling for truth or dare and this i guess is the night one curveball obviously producers have created this and thrown it into the game i don't think this works i I think this was a big misfire i feel like it is trying to take something from basically love island they're always playing truth or dare and making out and stuff and it's um, it doesn't play on night one, I would say. They're not yeah. comfortable enough with each other. I know Absolutely. it's... I like how they do it in Love Island because it's a great way to break the touch barrier, get a bunch of yep. random facts about people out. Yeah. Um, but I agree. It felt stilted the way they introduced it as if he's coming up with this. Yeah. And then, um, oh, guys, I did I like just... that Austin did the streaking voluntary nudity play. You like that? I thought that that was also bad producing. What? You don't like streaking? Not again, not on night one. I agree with what you're saying. This is a group date activity Mm. in maybe week two or three. Here on night one, so if this guy is even naked, who knows? He he strips down to his like a woman who can't even say penis. Yeah. Is gonna see a penis on night one? I don't think he did. She's swerving a kiss? Maybe he did. I don't know. But it was also like the producers are the ones coming up with the dares. So the producers are sitting there like, oh, what if we make a guy streak through the mansion it's like this it's weird it just feels like not right for a bachelor and bachelor at night one are class it's prestige Mm -hmm. this takes it down a notch into a weird tone that like the night one should never have this tone in my opinion unless it's somebody really doing it says it's supposed to be the most eligible bachelors in the country don't i mean that's an immediate fool at it when you're having someone streak Mm -hmm. it's a fool at it that they're giving to to a lot of people, uh, yeah. Moe's I thought was going to make my air when he said that he's ghosted tons of girls. Totally. Just so 4TWR. I would also say with Austin, you can 
in this moment, he has a choice to make. The thing comes up. You have to streak. You can say no to this. But he knows you can't really. Because if you say no to it, you're gone night one. Unless you're in Jen's top whatever, the producers are going to be like, oh, you're not going to play our game? Bye-bye. So he Mm. kind of is painted into a corner with it. And I think he knows that. So he does it. Yeah, to refuse the truth or the dare is basically a protest of I'm not playing the game. Yeah. And so he he doesn't have a choice. But I don't know. I just didn't like this at all. Uh, uh, but what I did like was that it begins the best face play I've ever seen by Hakeem. Oh. This man, I don't know. He's got like double jointed eyeballs. I He's don't unreal. know how he is making the face plays that he is. I he it was electric. Yeah, um, his eyes are a thing to behold. His eyes are eyes are to Hakeem what tongue, teeth, and lips were to McKenna Dorn. I'll simply say that <laughs> what mouth was to Olivia Caridi. Yes. I I loved it. This is Gay's play on an aperture level we've never seen in my life, and I hope he makes it to hometown. Oh, they recognize his singular talent. There's, is this where you gave your face play or no? No. Me either. But it's him, and it's later. Like you saw yeah, of in course. the way they were presenting Hakeem, they get it. They yeah. see what he's giving them, and they're gonna. Put that shit in a frame for you every episode. Glazeman 4.0. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like Justin Glaze kind of opened the door to real hardcore eye face play. Hakeem is just yeah. sprinting through the door and out the fucking wall, like leaving a silhouette of his body in the bricks yeah, on the other side. Of the wall. Manning yeah. it. <laughs> we we go from oh, this face play to a little bit of one on one time with Sam in the love virgin. And this is where he explains directly to Jen that his older brother married his only girlfriend and that's what he wants to do too. And you can see Jen just being like, okay, uh, help. (laughs) (laughs) What do you mean? You don't think she liked the line, I want our souls to kiss, not our lips? I mean, who doesn't want their souls to kiss? I'm looking for a soul kiss pretty much all the time. But uh, I think Sam N is going to be basically our fool for the next however long he can yeah, last. They might even put him in a rivalry. To keep him. We then see um, we get a cliffhanger actually right here of Jonathan taking off his bandages on some one on one time, and we come back from that cliffhanger, and uh, he asks if he made a good first impression. I thought this was very good NLP neuro linguistic programming here. Plant in her head, first impression, me, first impression, me, first impression, me. So maybe you get that Fimp Rose. It was a good effort here, I thought. But she can't give the Fimp to someone who is doing this type of limo exit, I don't think. Give the she fimp has to, to give you it want. to someone who's 4TRR. Give the Fimp to whoever well, you want. Obviously, The producers heavily lean on a player for Fimp. Heavily. I mean, heavily. But yeah, I would argue they don't get to decide it. <laughs> But sure. The bottom line is this. As the lead, you literally can do whatever you want. Now, that may not be a great thing in your season. Producers might get mad at you and do bad things to you. Although I think the era may be over. But in terms of FIMP especially, even if the producers are like, you got to give this guy the FIMP, she doesn't have to do that. She could have given him the FIMP here. Had his NLP been stronger. Maybe she would. We get... (laughs) We get uh, this one-on-one time I wrote. She unwraps him. He is tabletop freed finally. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Um, The next portion we get, uh, I mean, it's kind of the JoJo Fletcher effect of like, it was yeah. a mask. It was a faceless thing. And then you're like, oh my gosh, this person is attractive. It's the Twilight Zone effect, but in reverse. Remember that episode of the Twilight Zone where the woman gets plastic surgery? And they unwrap Aww. her face and she's like beautiful, but all the doctors are like twisted and distorted and shit in this world. Everybody else in the world looks hideous, but she looks beautiful, but they think she's hideous because they see themselves as beautiful. Gotcha. I watched The Swan, so I kind of know what okay. you're talking about. Perfect. A show that was on TV yeah. where w- women would basically get told that they're really ugly and then they get a bunch of plastic surgery and then they reveal their new look. Are you watching that Dallas Cheerleaders show? Dallas Cowboys Cheerleaders no. show on Netflix? 
It's called, uh, I forget what it's called, but it's about these women who show up to become Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders, like try, try out for it and stuff. And the, the mm -hmm. language that the, the leaders of the thing, like the, the people who are making the decisions on who's going to make the team and putting together the routines and stuff, the language they use is so fascinating. They're talking about like this one girl is basically too short and they keep saying like, yeah, I just think it's her scale. I think her scale is not quite right for this. They try to like make it very objective when clearly it's just like, we think she's too short. It's insane. I her highly bones recommend this show. bones aren't long enough. We need longer yeah. bones on her. And yeah. Then maybe she could come back. That's an interesting accent. Lengthen those bones. <laughs> is that? I've never been to Dallas, but yeah, that's what that's I'm that's exactly what, what they sound like. I grew up yeah. there. I am a source boy. That's my source voice. We uh we get anyway. Dark, we get portion four. Dark Lord Pulver comes in. He lays the fimp rose, the first impression rose, on a tray. Puts it on the table. They're all looking at it. The music gets tense. Ricky says, "This isn't a competition." And fimp most rose dangerous, means first impression rose. Uh yeah, fimp is first impression. Ricky says, "This isn't a competition." And most dangerous says, "Basically, yes, it is." And he's correct, but you can't say that out loud, most dangerous. You can't say it out loud. Mm -hmm. We all know it's a game. You can't say it's a game. That's part of the game. Mm -hmm. One of the, the first rules of the game is this ain't a game. It's like Fight Club. You're making the Moe's errors, Moe's. Just kidding, you're not. He does a little bit with the math on the board. Three X's, cross them out, gets her to say I love you. That was some neurolinguistic programming. Yep, for sale. Uh, yeah. Jen reveals that she'll break dance at bars. Um, I just started watching this Love Island UK season and they call uh this the the slut drop <laughs> is the like butt on the floor kind of okay. bounce back up. Interesting. I love that I love that term. <laughs> um Hakeem then does something that I wanna say is in the book. Makes a secret handshake with Jen it so is. that they can have this little physical interaction every time they see each other. It may not be for ring winner, but she knows he is the most likable mm -hmm. person on this season. Yeah. And yeah. she's going to keep him as long as they need. It's worth noting that when Lizzie says it's in the book, the book is called How to Win the Bachelor. It's a book that oh. we wrote uh, that basically outlines how to play this game, how to make a, a deep run through it. We also see here Brett uh, does the splits. This is where he does the splits when they're having that breakdance conversation. And we see Dylan bonding over being in the medical field. Iconic. We see Ricky dancing with her. And Jen then gets this ITM that she's never felt this cherished before. It feels like she's the main character in her own love story. And I think this, again, it's how they're painting Jen, that she's never had this experience of feeling worthy or valued or loved and that it, finally mm -hmm. it's going to happen in this season of The Bachelorette. Then we see some of the most fascinating one-on-one -on -one play that happens in this night one. Jeremy, this is my favorite scene. Me too. It was mine as well. Jeremy takes her out to the Corvette that he drove in with, and they're talking about how he's from New York or Connecticut, and uh, he loves traveling. And then we see Brian basically saying, like, I'm going to go steal her in that car. And he starts creeping out there. And as they're talking and about it's travel, noted this is Jeremy's car, he says. He has flown this car out. There is absolutely zero way that is true. He does say that, but it did seem like he was kind of joking or something. It's just simply not true. The producers this rented this car. A hundred percent not his car. hundred percent. Are you going to tell me you think that that van that Heather Martin drove across country was not her van? I'll tell you that as well, yeah. Oh, my God. No. Just think of Trick it budgetarily. Again. How much does it cost to rent that car for a night versus how much would it cost to ship a car from New York? I have literally no idea. The car rental is much cheaper. Um, so they're I don't in know. The... Maybe he's a, a millionaire. Maybe he's... You, he did it with his own money, you think? Maybe he's connected to the Firestone. He's the Aaron Borgie <laughs> of Corvettes. All right. So uh... <laughs> they're talking about this and Brian comes up and he basically attempts a steal here. He uses the key for the car to open the door. And he's just looming over Jeremy. And he's like, I want to talk to her. Jeremy's like, give me five minutes, dude. And he's like, no. Finally, Jeremy, Jeremy relents. Jeremy attempts to block it. But Brian forces the steal in my... Error, 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 error. 
of the game. He had, I just, it was, look, I'm sure the producers made him do this. I'm sure they said, here are the keys. If you want time, you're going to go steal Jeremy's car Mm -hmm. and make Jen talk to you in Jeremy's car. I know they made him do it. Of course. Probably. um, But I still think he should have not gone along with it because it was so aggressive Mm -hmm. and felt strange as jen calls it a bold move (laughs) um yeah like stealing is an art and block block stealing is an art too you never want to attempt a block that gets uh taken down steamrolled well if i were jeremy i would have just grabbed those keys and be like she'll come get you in five Mm -hmm. you gave this Uh, your error of the game while yeah. Brian's steal from Jeremy was my play, 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 play of the game. Brian, I think, has correctly recognized he is not playing a first audience game anymore. I think he knows immediately Jen is not into him. Of course. And he has no chance at winning this in terms of winning a ring. Therefore, what does he have left? He has to play a third audience game. And if those produ- that's the producers. But didn't he go home? Brian? I don't think so. Oh, he didn't? Oh. Hang on. Let me check my records. My bad. My bad. <laughs> no, Brian did not go home. Wow. Brian got the 10th rose in the rose ceremony. Wow. Um. All right. Well, if, he, then maybe he did what he had to do. That changes my mind a little bit. But That's what I'm saying. I think once you recognize that you don't have any shot at the first audience, the lead, you have to pivot immediately and do a hard, full court press on the third audience, the producers. So if they tell you, go out there and yank that guy out of that Corvette and take his time, mm-hmm. you do that. And he was up against somebody <laughs> That was like carjacking play. The guy was literally sitting in a car that he used in his limo exit and saying, Hey dude, give me five minutes. And he was like, no, let me in that car. He just bullied his way into a steal. And that's a hard thing to do. And I think it showed the producers like, okay, this guy can do anything. Basically he'll do anything we want. Like no matter what, that means he's going to stay around for at least two or three episodes. They're going to try to get him on a group date and rivalry. I think, I think it only got him one. I can't believe he made it through night one with this move. I think I, my empathy for Jen in this moment, I think is too strong. And the repulsion that I felt is hard to picture. She's not feeling from this move. So yeah, it's a it's more of a, more of a feeling. And I think it's not, not going to look good to the fourth audience, not looking good to the second audience, the only audience or first, you're only playing to the third. Yeah. The first audience is the lead. The second audience is the other players. The third audience is the producers. And the fourth audience is us, Bachelor Nation. Yeah. Well, we'll see what happens with him. But it was my play of the game. We move on to Devin got some interesting one-on-one time where they're talking about her toes. And he's saying his biggest turnoffs are people being self-centered or not having your toenails done. Uh, he says he likes feet, and she she starts talking about shaving her toes. I thought this was a lot of toe work very early on. I loved that she said that she shaved her toes. That is a relatable Disney princess looking lady. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love Devin. I feel like he is doing some like grocery store play. I know he's not from Chicago supposedly, but. That accent sounds like grocery to me. Whoa. Sounds just like this. I don't <laughs> like when girls don't have their nails done. Yeah. I want to bite your toes. Let me take a bite of your feet. Let me get a bite of that. <laughs> uh, Grant then has an interesting one on one time where he takes her out in the driveway to shoot some baskets and says, if I win, I get a kiss. And then we just get quick shots of Jen just sinking three-pointers, draining shit from half court. And uh, then he gets a steal, too, before he can even capitalize on the kiss thing. Thomas N., I think, comes in to steal. And we move on to another portion. Oh, but he did do a gentleman. Yeah, he did. Gave Jen his jacket. She was wearing his jacket the whole time. Cold Los Angeles nights, shooting about two months ago. We see Marcus getting some one-on-one time. We see Aaron uh, getting his one-on-one time where he brings up young Noah Herb. And she's like, oh, yeah. So there's some kind of... Aaron is like 
kind of operating under this hyper praising of the process. Mm -hmm. It's like, I know this can work. My literal twin brother, who he claims that he's older than him. He's like, you're getting the older, better version. He's older by seven seconds. We have to remember. Seven <laughs> seconds. These are twins. <laughs> I have uh, 11 children, which is hard to forget. You know who else what had 11 are... children? Yes. Nick Vial. We can see now at this point, it is morning outside. <laughs> I'm happy you, you feel love. Thank you. We can see outside through the windows of this mansion, this new mansion, Hummingbird Nest Ranch, that it is fully morning and the fimp has not yet been handed out. So she comes in, picks up that fimp and walks out of the room. We cannot recommend enough to never be sitting in the room with the fimp. You never want to be there when it's on the tray because the person who gets it is almost never in that room. They always want that shot. No, I think they make them. I think they make them sit next to it. They they I think might at this point. They might, but get up and any go to the reader bathroom. is going to know to not sit there. So I yeah. don't know. Cool. But she pulls Sam M for the Fimp Rose, goes off and says there's something there. She can't stop thinking about him all night. Something in her gut that's telling her there's something there, and she's excited to get to know him more. He accepts the fimp, and then she kisses him, and they make out, essentially. This is the first kiss of the night. So he gets the fimp. He gets the first and only kiss, at least on camera, the only mm -hmm. kiss we saw all night. And Jen gives one of my favorite lines she utters all day, the kiss was feral. I laughed out loud <laughs> yeah. so hard. That's in keeping with this ferocious love and stuff. She's very into like yeah, it's reckless, just untamed yeah. wildness in her love. Yeah. And she then, just starts like <laughs> creating chaos throughout the season, just spraying them down with yeah. hoses randomly, cackling. <laughs> yeah, they're all asleep. She comes in just like <laughs> mud all love. over her. Her dress is all like tattered up. I've been out in the wilds. I'm ferocious. I'm feral. <laughs> she <laughs> wake up. She's just like slapping guys, dumping pots of boiling water on them. Ah, I'm feral. You never know what I'm gonna do. <laughs> yeah. The producers are like, what the fuck is going on? She's feral. She's setting little fires in their bedrooms, like, ha, feral dead. Gotcha. <laughs> and then uh after the feral play, Jesse Palmer, the Dark Lord, <laughs> enters the room with a ten ting. We have never seen this before. Ting, 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 ting. If you're not on the YouTube, it is when he takes knife to glass. Ten ting. Just for a toast. Anytime it. Uh, our host comes in, the Dark Lord, Jesse Palmer, and he brings knife to glass, ting, 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 or however many he does, that signifies the end of the standard round of play has concluded. It's like a buzzer in any other sport. Time is out. And now you must face the consequences of the plays you've made. Will you get a rose or will you be sent home? And we see it is the rose ceremony. Dylan gets the first flower, which statistically is a very important rose. First flower of night one usually means that that player has been selected by Jen Tran as somebody she wants to go for and who also has not already started some kind of rivalry with someone else. There is no drama with this person, so they're not going to save them till the end. Instead who we do see getting the final rose of this night is Sam in the love virgin. And they've kind of pumped him up with some ITMs about like, Oh, I just, I can't believe it. If I don't go home, I'm going to be shattered, et cetera, et cetera. That's kind of the drama they build here tonight for the final rose, which isn't that great. Night one is hard to build a uh, drama around if somebody's going to stay or not. Usually want that to be in a rivalry. DLP. The first flower also statistically in bachelor does better than even the fimp rose. Yes. That's a little bit. And then Dark Lord Palmer gives us the Tam Sig, the take a moment, say your goodbyes. Jen tears up saying they all made her feel so special, so deserving. And we say goodbye to Brendan, Brett, Dakota, Kevin, Matt, Mose, and Ricky. Of these, Brett, Mose, and Ricky are the ones that I am floored by, that they are not yeah. keeping them. I, I don't know what's to come in this season. I don't know what producers saw that night that made them think these guys shouldn't be here. Brett, especially. Moses' ITM was bad. Yeah. He was like looking off to the side. It did, just didn't seem, but definitely villain character exactly. energy. Exactly. And so this kind of leads me to believe they don't want a big villain this season. 
And I think it has to do mm. with the the historic significance of this season of Jen Tran being the first Asian bachelorette. I think they want to, you know, kind of make this like a... Uh, not not wholesome isn't the right word, but like they don't want it to be a super dramatic season coming from villain vibes. I believe they want hmm. the drama to come from the love story, which is similar to what they did with uh, Grazia Day. And I think that's why they might have plucked Moe's out. But I agree. The Brett and Ricky both struck me as like great colorful narrators. I can't believe you're not going to reward the one person who has body diversity in the cast yeah. who does... Colorful narration in the splits. I agree. We've. I don't think we've ever seen a man do splits. On I the agree. Show. I literally don't know why they did not keep him. It. I think in terms of like one of the biggest kind of outcries within Bachelor Nation is about body diversity. He's the only person mm -hmm. in this cast who is uh, an example of that. And to get rid of him on Go night check one. Check out roses for everybody. They, this yeah. is a strong cause they are promoting. I can't imagine why the producers selected him for removal. Even if he's not like the best on camera, which he was, like he was entertaining. Yeah, I'm almost like, was it his choice? Did he kind of tell the on his Instagram? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why he, they kicked him off. It sends like a worse message, I think, if you're like, look, we did cast somebody who's outside the normal kind of yeah. range of of what you might see body wise for somebody in Bachelorette, and we kicked him off night one. That sends a worse message than just not casting him in the first place, in my opinion. It's like they, I mean, used to do with racial diversity. Yeah. It's just like they would never make it far, um, players of color. Uh, you know, we're, it's the only body diversity we've ever seen in a man, right? Yeah. Except maybe that one guy on Claire Crawley's season. You could argue Bob Guinea was that in, mountains. in Bachelorette season one. That's true. That's true. Um, Nonetheless. Yeah, I'm, you know what? Where <laughs> the bachelor's uh, trail through progress is just, you know, it's it's, it's slow. network TV. It's slow to make slow. progress, <laughs> and it's it's they kind of fumble it. It's clumsy when they do make progress. I would it's clumsy. I would harken back to the the thing at the beginning of this episode that we we're talking about. My Jorge Moreno bystanders, those two Asian women that were like, it was like the show's patting itself on the back about having their first Asian bachelorette, but the show has been on the air since 2002, 22 years. It's like, yeah. you don't get a pat on the back for that. Just do it and keep doing it. You know, you can't have like characters in your show being like, oh my God, you're so amazing for doing this. It's like, no, you're not. It took way too long. Yeah, the number of seasons is just at this point where it's yeah. like, okay, well. <laughs> it's good that it's happening. I'm not discounting that, obviously. It is very important, and I'm glad that it's happening. But the way they're presenting it is a little too, like, look, see, we're doing it, everybody. See, we're doing what you asked. It's a little too much of that. They just need to pull that back a little bit and just be like, look, it's normal. Who cares? That, to me, I think is the tone of it, and they're not hitting that tone. A small complaint. But okay, here's I just thought of an alternate theory for the end yeah. that has never been done. What if this we see this promo, you know, she wants to be worthy of love, they're going right to Mel Melbourne, mm. and we see Mesny, we see Trista, we see Charity, we see love level threes. What could go wrong? Jen says, and someone from the past wants to join. What if she takes someone who was never on the show, an ex, puts them on the show, gets engaged to the ex? I'm very curious to see who that person is. I, I don't know. I don't think that's going to happen. God, I just don't think that's going to happen. Her whole story has yeah. been about... I mean, that's probably that's probably even less likely, yeah. but yeah. Her whole story has really been about like these toxic exes and stuff. I don't think that there's going to be some guy coming yeah. from the past that is able to do that. But before we get to that, there is a moment where Jen tells all the guys, this is going to be historic, those that remain, tomorrow they leave for Melbourne, Australia, which they have never done. International travel on day two. We have never seen anything like this. And we see all the guys reacting. Oh my God, I can't wait for this. Mm -hmm. And in the background of one of the shots, we see Hakeem give my face play of the game. We are talking full eye, full mouth aperture. The excitement that he is conveying through this face play is off the charts. The other men who are standing around him seem to be statues by comparison. Their face plays, <laughs> while good, they all seem excited. 
can't hold a candle to what Hakeem is doing here. His face demands viewership. His face demands that he is the center of attention and the star of any frame he's in, even if they're not speaking by what he's doing with his face play. I am so astounded by what he did on night one. Two incredibly strong face plays. This, this final one was mind blowing. I cannot wait to see what he's going to do when he, it's like, Oh, you're on the, uh, the Fruit farm, day, whatever the farm yep. obstacle course. You have to drink goat milk. Show me his face when he's drinking goat milk. I can't wait. I can't wait. Thank you. Hakeem. <laughs> Hakeem opening up his mouth and his eyes in a way in which if you were a Disney cartoon artist drawing a cartoon's face, you would turn it into your boss and they would say, this is not a real face, go smaller, was also my face play of the game. I will get to it. I loved everything Hakeem did in this episode. Me too. His fourth audience, his second audience play were outstanding. His first audience, obviously his third to get that coveted limo exit mm -hmm. i he to me he is the standout from this episode I agree. and his face play was a big part of it i agree 100 percent um and then like you said we got this this long teaser for the rest of the season that included so many things the the legacy cameos mesnick charity trista i love seeing that and I, we've been oh, talking yeah. about that for a long time that The Bachelor, the one thing that The Bachelor has over any of the Netflix shows is legacy. Yes, it has taken them 22 years to have their first Asian Bachelorette, but they also have 22 years of players who have come in and out of this game and still have great meaning to people who are fans, like lifelong fans of the show, like Pace Case and I. And so to see more of them being pumped through every season, I absolutely love that. And I can't wait to see what group dates they're going to be on or how they're going to be introduced. It looked like a Mesnick was in a radio station, it looked like. So maybe they're going to have to do that. Ooh, podcast? Well, do you remember that? Um, God, I forget what season it was on, but they made them go into a radio station. I and do like a radio oh. appearance. Do you remember that? I thought you were going to say the Ashley Hebert song recording. With Seal? Yes. No, I think it was, it was a was different There was a podcast? Episode. What? They went into a radio station and had to do like a radio performance on a group date maybe. I don't remember exactly, but... I can't remember. A lot seems to be happening in this season as we see this teaser. Lots of tear play. L lots of... Aaron Herb is issuing a general 4TWR yeah. accusation. I was like, Damn. to say the name. That was mind blowing. When she's like, who is he's it? He's thirsting. Nope. That's for you to find out. He puts it on her. And he's right, by the way. He is he's right. He's right. That's one of the That's jobs of the lead. Play, baby. Crown got to do that investigation. That ain't on the player. I can tell you some crimes are being committed. You got to figure out. I'm the investigator. Out. Exactly. I'm just the tattletale. I'm just the neighborhood watch. I'm just the tattletale. <laughs> Um, I can't wait to see that. I it seems like we are gonna get a couple of villains. Um, it's kind of unclear mm. who which ones they are. Someone's got a web of lies. Sam M. Jen Somebody accuses know how to be in a healthy relationship. Someone accuses Sam M. of being calculated. That was in there. Um, Bradley Cooper. Yeah. So we'll see. Mm. And of course, that ends with her putting that final rose back on the pedestal. And that is the end of Jen Trance, historic Bachelor at season twenty one, night one. God damn, it was great. I um, am very curious to see what's going to happen. These format changes. The new mansion, which they only spent one night in it. I like that mansion. Mm -hmm. It had tones of... It was nice. Villa de la Vina, but bigger. And of course, we've seen it in Listen to Your Heart already. It didn't bump me. It didn't bump me either. But we're never going to go back to it. Or maybe they will in the very end. I don't know. But now everything else, they're moving immediately to Melbourne, Australia. So imagine being the player. You have this... I love that. That's budget. It is. I agree. It's like they're rolling out the carpet a little bit. But if you have one night with Jen Tran to be like, okay, we're kind of getting to know each other. Next morning, you don't see her now for another probably two days because you're going to spend the yeah. next day flying to Australia. Then you're going to have the next day, maybe you have your first group dates and one-on-ones and stuff. It, it kind of jostles the play style, I feel like, a little bit. But I like that a little yeah. bit. I'm like, let him cook. Yeah. Let him be like... Uh, you know, without their phones, mm. without their loved ones and yeah. support, you know, for a little while. 
and uh, then see what kind of plays they're going to make to get time. Yeah. Well, we'll see how the, the season winds up. Pace Case, who was your MVP? For his gorgeous limo exit, for his face play, for his second audience play, for his everything play, Hakeem mm. was my M M M M V P. Interesting. I thought he was electric, and he is the reason I am very excited about this season right now. Fascinating. I agree with you. I can't wait to watch uh, everything that he does, but Sam M was my M M M M M V P. He got the film. He got not only the first kiss of the season. The only kiss of night one. He is, in my opinion. That we saw. What's that? That that we saw, yeah. But that's the document. Yeah. Part of being a good player is being able to manipulate the edit. And even if other people were kissing yeah. her. A calculated love. Exactly. Even if it's calculated. It's good calculation. He got the Fimp Rose. He got this uh, first kiss. He kind of has become the guy to beat, I feel like, at this point. If he mm. gets one of the early one-on-ones... I mean, he's a major contender for endgame run. It does seem like I would guess he's making it to hometowns. Yep. I would guess Dylan is making it to hometowns. You know, I'm very curious how it's going to shake out. As am I. But thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we, we have one more announcement to make. On this program, we have had something called the DWAB which was, it stood for Days Without a Black Bachelor. And we, re we retired that when Matt James became the first Black Bachelor in season 25. And for a while, we have changed that to Dwab, Days Without an Asian Bachelor. And even though Jen is not a bachelor, she is a bachelorette, we feel that this season historically is important enough that we should give Jen the honor of retiring the Dwab. So that is what we are doing right now. Mm -hmm. It is forever... <laughs> Uh, retire, and we congratulate the Jen. The Dwab has reached zero, basically. Basically. We we congratulate Jen on what she is doing this season. Cannot wait to watch mm -hmm. everything that she turns in. It looks like it's going to be a fanta another fantastic season. Really coming out of the Fleissian yeah. era into this era of putting their leads on pedestals and really building shows around the narrative of the love story instead of the narrative of kind of the petty disputes among players or the forced villainy or whatever it may be. And so thank you, Jen, in advance for everything you're about to do for Bachelor Nation mm -hmm. and for us personally here at Game of Roses. Uh, I just can't wait to watch this season. I can't wait either. I think that they gave her a fantastic edit. I feel like they're going to protect her this season. At least that's the impression I'm getting from this. Yeah. And I... I'm just so happy that it seems like we are in this renaissance of Bachelor, renaissance of reality TV in general, um, and I'm very happy about it. And I can't wait to see what happens in Australia. The last time we went to Australia on Bachelor, I loved it. <laughs> yes, I have some fond memories Pete of it as well. Papa sitting on a rock, yeah. talking to Madison Pruitt and the flies. You're getting eaten alive good by day. He said good day, Sheila's to them when oh. he came in. They were all in the same fantasy suite. Yeah. It was beautiful. That's where we got Sleucy and Protocol. We know what we signed up for. But that wraps up our show. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Remember, if you're in Los Angeles on Monday nights, come out to 33 Taps in Silver Lake. We will be there in some capacity. Shot o'clock at 8 p.m. That's right. Uh, so we hope to see you there. And we will be back this Friday with a This Week in Bachelor Nation, breaking down some of the Instagram movements of some of these players. Did anybody see a big bump from tonight's big game? Uh, did it have no effect? Is it uh, in any way going to be a repeat of Joey Grazia Day, which did see some big Instagram movement, mm -hmm. at least for the final four? We'll, we'll be covering all that, all the news, yeah, everything that at least towards the end. We're going to cover Jen's numbers as well. And if you missed it, we had a Patreon Digging Deeper episode come out yesterday that was a certified juicer. And I think they're only going to get juicier as the season continues. I cannot wait to recap the season with you, Clues. Same pace case. Looking very forward to it. That's patreon.com slash Game of Roses. Praise be... Dark Lord Palmer.